It happened again. It happened again. Tottenham Hotspur. It happened again. This is the Arsenal Vision Post Match Podcast. My name is Alex Pithy Gabot, me on Twitter, Yankee Gunner. Yeah, I mean, I I really thought we were going to get another six or seven conceded by Tottenham today, another refunded away ticket. I mean, they have literally, their away days have literally been living the Simpsons meme where he comes into the bar, puts his hat on the hat rack, t- does a circle, takes his hat off the hat rack, and leaves the bar. Um, you know, Abe Simpson. But uh, yeah, just recording this at full time of Liverpool 4, Tottenham 3. And in retrospect, I actually think the way they lost it was funnier to watch Richarlison score. Is that, I think, his first goal that was actually allowed of the season? He's had a couple. Two that were disallowed, yellow card, red card, sent off, Spurs lost. This one, he finally scores, shirt off, yellow card. One minute later, they concede, they lose. Absolute scenes. Um, and and you just have to enjoy it. And we can't smile without them. Uh, unless happy notes, we have slipped to second place. But I will say that now City in first place, it is the most dangerous position in the table. People have always said that. So we'll have to see how they hold up to that. And there's a really interesting chart making the rounds showing that Arsenal, this Arsenal team, if we do not win the title, will be the team that has spent the most days of the season in first place in the history of the league without winning it. I think it's like 93% of the available days so far. Uh, Second, by the way, was another Arsenal team. So, you know, maybe it's just part of our football heritage. We are going to talk about a few things today. We're going we're to get into all the issues that are circulating, and we're going to use um, your questions that you uh, a- asked on Twitter and on the Discord for patrons uh, to, to frame these questions, these topics that are relevant right now. But we're going to start uh, with a little look ahead briefly to tomorrow's massive game for the women at a sold-out Emirates Stadium. So let me introduce the people who are here to do that. First is Paul. You can find him on Twitter. Pause my pants. Hello, pause. Woo-hoo. And Clive. You can find him on Twitter. Clive PFC. Hello, Clive. Hello, hello. Tim is actually doing work uh, for the women's game in preparation of the women's game today, and and his women's arts cast is out. But, uh, Clive, you're going to the game tomorrow. We're going to do an instant reaction for the patrons. You're going to be there at a sold-out Emirates uh, for the second leg. First leg was 2-2. Arsenal fell behind 2-0, rallied to uh, to equalize at Wolfsburg. They play Wolfsburg at the Emirates tomorrow, and a lot of injuries in this game. How do you see this game both in terms of the historic – component of it in selling out the Emirates for the first time ever for a women's game, the importance in terms of our next step in European football and the challenge given that we have so many injuries. Yeah. Women's sport in, in the UK is really booming. I mean, England rugby had a massive crowd, 60,000 yesterday beat in France and also going to have 60,000 in a Champions League game. I must admit, I never thought I'd see this. Uh, I never thought I'd see it. And imagine how Tim's feeling today, you know, he's been doing, He's been doing this circuit for many, many years, and um, this is a major moment in, in our history. And the club have been very smart in their foresight, you know, regarding making Arsenal almost like one club. Everything, all their marketing has all been alongside each other. They've done wonderful things around gender parity that I've learned from myself how smart they are. And um, coming back to the game. Um, this game, I think Arsenal played Wolfsburg last year in Champions League. I think it was a quarterfinals and got smashed. And um, physically, Wolfsburg were much better. And that first leg, um, given the fact that we just lost Liam Wilmotson in a game versus Manchester United, that should never have happened, in my opinion. It was rearranged and they pulled it forward. They end up losing the England captain in a game that's going to cost England in the World Cup that should never have been there. you know. And, um, and so... We go into the game in the first leg, and I just thought we was just going to lose. Just didn't have enough physicality, enough experience. No Kim Little, no Leah Williamson, no Beth Mee, no Viviana Miedemar. That's basically your four most high-profile players. Two captains gone. What they did very smartly was bring in Gen B2, who is the next leader, play the back three, and just try to you know approach the game that way. And Gen B2 is quite a physical centre-half, and Wolfsburg are quite physical. So it, was, it actually wasn't a bad matchup. And so they went into the game and, and went 2-0 down due to some play out the back from Jen Beattie. Actually, they went wrong. But then they rallied and they scored a great goal by Raffaelli and then they equalised with Stina Blackstenius. And to be honest, Blackstenius is someone I've always swayed on and she was magnificent in this game. She r- mm-hmm. talked about run the channels. I mean, she, her energy and confidence has really come back because there was a period in the transfer window where Rumoured, Arsenal offered her up for Alessia Russo, the Manchester United centre forward, 
And I think her confidence dipped there. I, I know Tim's listening to this. He's, he's going to give me, he's going to give me marks out of ten. <laughs> See, I've been listening to him and um, and Alessia Russo was who's who's an England centre forward and Arsenal were interested in her on a, on a world record fee. And I think Black Sinners, his confidence went, but he's back now. I thought she, I thought she was excellent in that in that first leg. So I think Arsenal will go with a, a back three again, and because um, they're lacking wingers due to injury. So. Let's see what happens. But um, it's going to be very exciting. I am a little bit worried how overawed the players may be in front of that size of crowd, but I think it might affect Wolfsburg more so than Arsenal. So hopefully the crowd can be a positive influence on the day and we get the result. Yeah, I mean, you always think, oh, big, loud, supportive crowd is always going to be in your favor. But if you're not used to that number Mm. of people and performing in front of that number of people there can be an element of sort of stage fright associated with it. I don't expect that to be the case. I think the stage fright would affect the away the away team or the home team, but it'll be interesting to see that dynamic. We will cover this in more detail um, throughout the week and certainly have an instant reaction for you on Patreon tomorrow, along with tons of other Patreon content should you want to be there. Uh, but we're going to kick on with the, with the uh, uh, questions that you provided. And, and Paul, I'm going to combine a ton of questions because like we got so many about this topic Mm. that I just think it it would be wrong to pick any one of them out because they're all asked in a variety of different ways, but all asking the same question. So uh, in keeping with our tradition of the mailbag, (laughs) I'm going to ask a question, uh, not the listener, and then we'll spend 30, 40 minutes responding to that one and say, sorry, we didn't get to your other questions. So it's all, you know, it's all about football heritage. Um, But the bulk of the questions really did boil down to Arsenal's ends of seasons and the Mm. way we ended last season, the way we ended this season with critical players grinding down, maybe not finishing the season as strongly or not even being available at the end of seasons. And the team seeming to collapse either under pressure, if you want to buy in a narrative, or just under fatigue and lack of availability. And a lot of these questions sort of revolved around minutes usage. Should subs be made earlier in games earlier in the season? Should the team be set up sort of the way City does, right? Where Pep has some players who just aren't playing for him middle of the season. Then what do you know? The last 15 games are playing every game, starting every game, winning every game, and suddenly they look unstoppable. So do you have any sort of high-level thoughts on consecutive seasons now where it appears that our momentum was halted either through injury or fatigue or both? Yeah, yeah. (laughs) It comes up a lot. People talk about it a lot. Um, it's the prevailing narrative at the moment, right? Yeah. I mean, when you see a thing going around sure, saying sure. we've led the league for 93% of the season and now we're on a four-match winless run, it, it's it's hard to get away from, you know? Yeah. I mean, it, you know, it, there are no wrong opinions and no right opinions on this one. When you have a data set of two points on a graph, do you draw a line through it, a curve? You know, what is that thing? Well, the two points connect. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of like saying you need triangles on a football pitch, but any three players form a triangle yeah. at any place all over the pitch. I've always laughed about that. It's like, look, a triangle, three yeah. points. What do you know? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And so like, but like football narratives, I mean, we have to make sense of stuff, especially stuff we're afraid of and, and like our dreams and our hopes and our, our, our tears and our nightmares all held in one. Of course, we want to be protected by saying, oh, this is the pattern. We've identified the pattern. And what happens is at the end of every year, going back to 1886, Arsenal always falls off in the last 10 games. What do we need to do ch- to change that? Well, obviously, last year, I think it's clearer and clearer when you look at it. We ran out of players. Um, There were the narratives out there. But the more and more you look at it, you say, we ran out of players. Now, could we have done better? Could we have done something different? Could the manager switch to this, that, and the other? Those are all very, very valid questions. This year, to a lesser degree, we've run lower on players. And unfortunately, I mean, you know, we had three draws in a row draws we could have won had we had a bit more gumption or umph and then we played city and they fucking blew the doors off us talk, talk about recency i don't know if that's re- recency bias but it's recency information the gap between them and us a team who like just watch the tour de france and see what those guys it doesn't matter who's leading on day one day 10 day 15 nothing matters till you get to the mountains 
and after the mountains, things are pretty much settled. And guys who are ahead at the start of any particular day in the Tour de France, doesn't really matter. They'll get reeled in nine times out of 10. And we're in a process. We're on stage three or something. DEFCON three, I don't know what uh, Mikel's measurement system is, that says we're, we're building, we're getting stronger. He's very, very addicted to a system. And like, that's not going away. He's only ever going to play one system. But within that system, he has all sorts of flexibility, right? Um, he can do all sorts of things. So maybe it's semantics and euphemism and blah, blah, blah. But he's going to play his system. He needs to become more adaptable. He needs more players that he trusts. And right now, I'd, here's the real issue with Arteta. He trusts about 12 players who were fit in the run-in. And those were his options. And does it inhibit us? Does it hold us back? Yes. Is it part of the reason we got to where we got? Yes. Would you have done something different after the fact, perhaps? Before the fact, let's take the Thomas Party thing. Very brief point on the Thomas Party thing. Some people are, a lot of us think he might have been carrying something. Therefore, some of us are saying, why didn't Arteta change it before that? Well, I thought he was carrying something and I didn't want him to change whether Thomas Party started in those games or not. Um, and there was a lot riding on Thomas Party. Big gaps, big spaces allowed us to play the way we played before, but we weren't playing as well. So the gaps were even bigger for Thomas Party. So I can't, I personally can't turn around now and say Arteta shouldn't have played him because I kind of knew this was the risk before he picked Thomas Party. And I don't think Thomas Party was the issue, even if he made mm. a mistake or two. Yeah. I, so it, it is always hard as you're forming an opinion to know if you're forming it post hoc, right? If you're taking what you've seen and fitting your opinion to match the evidence or it, it, so the, the best way I can say this, I think what I'm reaching for is correlation doesn't equal causation, right? I think there are questions about whether Mikel Arteta uses his squad efficiently enough over the course of a season. But sure. to be fair, he's rebuilding a squad <clears throat> and we're early on this phase and he doesn't have the number of players that he trusts. I think we did see a little bit of a delay last season and this season for Mikel to respond to certain challenges. So last season, for example, and Paul, earmuffs, please. I think he was slow to respond to the Lacazette thing, not providing us what we needed. I, I know. Chew, chew, chew your wrist off. Do whatever you got to do. Bite, bite, bite down on some leather. Um, <laughs> we don't kink shame here. Um, I think he was a little slow to respond to that, right? And and it may ref have been a reflection of a lack of conviction in what his other options were. And if you look at this season, our season boils down to two key periods where we weren't at our best. And you can see them in the XG data, by the way. The period when Enkedia came in, after we won that United game, our XG started to drop off pretty consistently. And it was a little slow to find an alternative there. And then this period where our XG against has skyrocketed. And you can point to holding, you can point to whatever you want, but we've been slow to maybe respond to that and come up with an alternative. And so I'll ask a question for you, Clive, that frames this maybe more articulately than the nonsense that I've just spit out. He says, having scrolled past the question, but it comes from little Mozart on the discord and it's related to Mikel's reaction to setbacks. And he says, Arteta has shown a remarkable ability to build a squad and impose definable tactics and a style of play. Agreed. How do you assess his ability to adjust when those tactics aren't working either through changing formations or through substitutions? And I'll throw in there just, you know, change of starting personnel as well, if you prefer. Yeah. I've been thinking about this a lot. <laughs> last few days um, <laughs> good question then and trying to give a different perspective from where he may may be seeing things so when you have a set of players six days a week talking to them messaging to them as a coach right the most important thing you must have is consistency of message and he has a set of principles that he drives into those guys every single day and then come the crunch time I think there's reluctance for him to move away from those messages. And I sort of get that. Because if you set up that environment, you set up that culture about who we are, how we play, what we do in certain scenarios, and when it gets a bit tough, you, 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 you bunker down, for example, and you change. And as soon as you do that, players don't believe you. They lose faith in you. You have to stick to your principles. Now, 
this is the next phase for him, to have an environment where your principles are flexible enough to allow you to implement a change based on what you're seeing and feeling amongst the players that you know. I think if you, example, if you look at what City do, and they can do it, I look at their bench for a cup game against Southampton. They got beat 4 0. I think it was a League Cup game or something C like that. They got beat 2 0, sorry. And then they beat Chelsea in the FA Cup game. When you look at their bench, it's basically the team that played against us the other day. <laughs> and that was their mm-hmm. bench. And so we haven't got that capability. So let's not pretend. So they're in a process of trying to peak to win multiple trophies. We're in a process of, oh my goodness, we're top of the table. Can we keep winning? Can we keep winning to achieve the top four? Because, oh, we're still here. We're still winning. Now, then we all start, you know, we all start to think in hindsight, could we have rested a few more players? Could we have done that? Well, lads, you know, we, we speak a couple of times a week, every week. <laughs> I don't remember too many violent lineup discussions. Do you? <laughs> you know, yeah. amongst us? So we all agree to this at time. Maybe a couple in Europe, maybe a couple in cup ties where we 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 question well, you how question the squad Italian. should be managed. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> you do. Well, you, know, you do. Every I like year. to say we because it takes some of the pressure <laughs> off me. But you know, <laughs> but you know, and I there's a, I give an example. A couple of little minor things. When Saka was ill against Leeds, he didn't start. We were all shocked. We we're doing well in the game. Then he comes on for the last twenty minutes. I think mm, could he have just gone away? But it's twenty minutes. You know, and then everyone goes, England played him for two nights. Oh, it's just another game. He's, he's not injured. Then when you see him against City, he hasn't got the zip that he had against Villa, for example, and Brighton, for example. And then you think, oh, okay, he just lost that 5% explosion. And he's still out there, but he's not able to separate. And then you think, damn it, could we have done something? <clears throat> it's all hindsight. We're in a different phase in our process, I'm afraid. And we have got, way more out of this group than I suspected we would get. At the start of the season, we talk about William Sleeper now, at the start of the season, we weren't sure what he's going to be. You know, we weren't sure what our back four was going to be, if he's going to be brought in. If he's going to, you know, now we realise what we have, we've reshaped our team, we've reshaped our fullback area, we've reshaped our midfield. We weren't talking about Granite Xhaka's role a year ago. Look what he's done this season. He's maybe not so box to box at the moment because he's showing a bit of fatigue. And we and the gaps are showing, and um, but I can't really complain because I've had basically one of the best seasons I've ever had, you know, and hmm. it's all because of this this group. And so, I, I, although I want, I look back and say, what could we have done? Apart from a couple of minor things, points, the Southampton was a bit silly at the start of the game. West Ham, yeah, we were better than them, a bit silly. Apart from that, you know, there was a. Just like a goal at Southampton when Tierney pulled it back. It just went over the line. Odegaard slotted it. If that had gone in two more points, we're talking maybe maybe six more points that we could have had. But maybe we'd have dropped him elsewhere. Maybe at Villa. Maybe at Bournemouth. We got we got points there that we maybe were not fortunate, but it felt great to get them. Do you know what I mean? Uh, and so these things do seem to level out. I think we if we end the season well, I, I can look back and say, the mistakes are far fewer than I that I've seen previously. Yeah, well, let me ask it to you this way, Paul. I mean, it, it's hard, right? Because the easiest and most obvious example for why we didn't get top four last season is, to your point, we ran out of players. Look at some of the starting lineups we put out in the, in the Spurs game, in the Newcastle game. That that's not a top four squad, frankly. And then this season, you could say. To compete with City, you really you really need a few things to go your way. You really need a bit of good fortune. And like it may sound silly to just say one absence, but it hasn't really been one, one absence, has it? Because in one of the games, it was no Saliba and no Shaka. In one of the games, it was no Saliba and no Zinchenko. And then the biggest game, it was no Saliba. So it, you can see how when the margins are so tight, so fine, those little absences can cost you the level you need because you got to get over 90 points. It didn't used to be this way, by the way. You didn't need to be over 90 points to win a title. That That's not how it used to work. In fact, that's never how it used to work. But let me go narrative a little bit for you. Look at the way we performed in the Newcastle game last season. That, to me, even more than the Derby, was the pressure game. Because we knew if we could win that game, we were probably going to be top four. 
And I think it is fair to say we we fully did not show up at St. James Park last season. And the pressure game this season, forget the West Ham points dropped, the Southampton points dropped, and the, the pressure game was at the Etihad. Now, that's always going to be a tough game. But we fully did not show up. And what I think is so interesting is some of the performers that I think have struggled most under the pressure in, in, in both of those situations weren't the kids. It was some of the, the senior leaders, if you want to call them that, some of the players with the most experience. How do you square, set aside hard factors, talent, tactics, injuries, because we know those are huge factors. Do you see parallels between the Newcastle performance last season and the City performance this season in terms of the crushing pressure leading to a performance that is so far from what this team has been about all season? I mean, just a, an absent performance altogether. Like, if I were going to have the equivalent games, it would be the Northland and Derby at the end of last year. Because, like, that's where the pressure was massive. It was all on. That was much more similar to the City game, where the pressure was massive. It was still all on. By the time that doesn't we lost. suit my narrative, though, because I don't know how that would have played out if we stayed eleven v eleven. So the Newcastle <laughs> game suits, suits my narrative a lot better. So, well, I think we went down a man because we were under massive pressure. Yeah, uh, um, that was going to be a tough day. And yeah. look, how do you? Why do we? Why? Why mentality? Why would we think we have a mentality issue? Like, there's a sequence of things here. First of all, you have to have enough players and be good enough to win games at yeah. the end of seasons before you start questioning whether a young team with a young manager has a mentality issue. That's what you find out when you have a team that's good enough to win games, losing them when they should, not showing up when they should have shown up. And... We didn't just miss a player or two. We were beginning to run on fumes, which is what the three games before that told you. It wasn't just, oh, you were missing William Saliba. It was everybody else was starting to get some level of gas. And just, you know, 5% off across your team screws things up. Why? Why would we have a mentality as you? There's no same old Arsenal. The, the manager, the the structure, the ownership, the players are all different. The The supporters are all different. That is a different uh, atmosphere, togetherness unit. Everything's different. There's no same old Arsenal. You had a really young team with, with a minimal squad last year, a somewhat more mature team that's done much better. You want to talk about narratives? Last year, for we were going for top four and just fell short last year. This year, mm -hmm. we blow through top four. So narratives say, next year, we're going to absolutely crush the league and win the title. If you want to do narratives and patterns, each year is going to be different. Um, there's a, the mentality of this team, there's no reason they shouldn't believe in themselves. They've had a, a level check on where we're at versus City. So has Edu. So has Arteta. So has everybody. They thought they were closer than they were. We're not. Now they got to dig deeper in the summer, yeah. go again. What's not to feel great? At, they're going. People are worried if they'll have lost confidence. I mean, it takes a little bit out of you, but look what we did in the summer. Look what we did. We started la last year. There was every reason to lose confidence if that's, that's what your group is. We went like a train. We won, what did we win? Nine out of 10, uh, yeah. eight out of nine in the first, like, but you know what we feel like once the summer comes around and we start playing a few friendlies and you got the players on the pitch and you got in a couple of new players. This is a great young squad. It's not their mentality we should be worrying about. It's ours, Elliot. We're the mental midgets. Yeah. I, I mean, <laughs> like, I, I don't, you know, I, I think like it, it is, it is tough for me because I have always railed against um, the idea of just going to soft factors and yada yada, right? And like, I do, I do look at it though, and I say post inner lull last season, we just kind of threw away some silly points, and then it was gone. Mm -hmm. And then we somehow pulled together performances to beat Chelsea and United, and then the pressure's back on, yeah. and then we just fell <laughs> fell apart until it was gone again. And like and this definitely season, definitely a young team, and we definitely yeah. have a young manager, and I'm sure he will look back on it and say, "I wish I'd done this, that, and the other." Like that, that he didn't consider, he clearly was not willing to do a plan B against City, no matter what happened. 
okay. that needs to be looked at. Well, well, so that leads to another question we got that I think is an interesting one, right? Because whether you want to put things on tactics or talent or pressure or psychology or whatever it is, there is something about how you finish a season, right? There, there yeah. are teams, look, in every sport, there are teams that are known for being clutch, right? There are teams for, known for turning it on when the seat, when it matters most. There are players that are known for that, right? Um, I, I do wonder if there's, if there's something to how you set up a season to be able to finish stronger. And that leads me to wonder if there's more that, you know, Mikel is going to learn. He's a young manager. He's still learning. So Clive, Kevin Deneen at Gunnar Deneen on Twitter says, just as the team has grown and improved, which I think is fair, what is Arteta's next big growth point as a manager? Um, we forget. Well, we don't forget. Had he won the title this season, it would have been the earliest any manager in Premier League history had ever won the title, right? Into their tenure as a manager. Um, uh, like in terms of, their first managerial appointment. So what do you, what do you think Clive? What's his next big development point as a manager? But, but I don't want anyone to miss even a drop of your wit and Sorry, intellect yeah. and, and analysis. Click, yeah. So we're going to do it with the mic unmuted. Damn it. I was going to interrupt Clive while he was on mute. <laughs> That's your last chance. <laughs> uh, when I look from a distance, I think um, the reaction to inadvertent change in his squad. You know, I think at that point, we as fans all have our own view of how that should be resolved. And then you get diversion of opinions, right? So, and I think for me, it's reading his squad, reading where they are in their physical levels and their mentality and adjusting accordingly. No, he doesn't do that. Honestly, he's just different to how I think about things, which is absolutely fine. You're different to me, Elliot. The first thing you picked <laughs> out of the Man City game was our passing was off. You're absolutely right, but that's how you view the game. You were right. Mm -hmm. I looked at the game. Our passing was off from exterior to interior. It was off. We got picked off. I'm thinking we weren't solid enough. We weren't. We didn't have enough people to compete in the middle of the pitch. I saw big spaces when I see our three midfielders in a track meet. We've already, we're already broken. Do you know what I mean? Some people may say our centre forward was off. I don't think it was strong enough. I don't think it's quick enough. Other people say our two wingers, they look tired. They suddenly look young. You can go where you want to go. Right? And I think when it comes down to it, I think we're at a different stage in our process. We're, we're still building. Last year, we had Zach Swanson at, on the bench at Spurs. We, and Amari Hutchison, I believe, was on the bench. We don't have Kint anymore. That's never going to play on the bench. So we've built the squad up to that level. Now we need to build it again so we can make three or four changes any given day and none of us go panic. Do you know what I mean? And I think when we can do that, then we can start to really think strategically how we manage the energy of a season. I heard a stat today that Man City have, I think they've lost one game in April in the last six or seven years which means they target the winning month. I think next season we may target the winning month rather than target the next training session, the next game, the next moment to try to build our club. Now we can go, we've got the extra revenues coming in. We can we can do that. So I think from our Arteta point of view, I think managing that I think is, is, is key. I also think... Um, Sometimes we talk about adjustments, tactical adjustments, and there are some that we don't spot. So we think he's playing exactly the same way based on the outcomes. But there are tactical adjustments that maybe we don't spot, the details that we don't spot. I think the next phase for us, really, for him, is to have the tools that make it obvious that we're changing how we play. And maybe some of that is... For, you know, I'm going to say around physicality, for example, a different profile of player in a position, distinct profile. So we may go for a, an attacking right back rather than a, a centre back right back. Do you, do you see what I mean? Or a or a stronger, bigger forward. And I don't care where it is, either on the wing or central areas. So we can you can see distinctly that we're changing something. I think at the moment our tactical switch our tactical moves are quite subtle, so we don't always see it. So we presume we're playing exactly the same way all of the time. But I think for him, having the tools to allow him to make ch changes, but also manage adversity slightly better. And I, and I felt that for the last two or three years. 
But that's maybe because I'm a pragmatist and he doesn't give a monkey's. He goes for it exactly mm. the same way. So that could be just a differing a differing view of the game. You know, and so I'm I'm conscious of that. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I I wonder if he'll look at Pep at the season end and he'll look at the two games, the home game and the away game in the league against Pep and say, he just went long against us. He wasn't afraid or ashamed to just play winning football against us. And he'll say, maybe, yeah, Clive, you want to come back in? Oh, I just want to say, he, he wasn't going long last season, but now he's got a six foot five in the forward. He's going long. Mm-hmm. So he's back to the tools again. When you have the tools, you can change. Yeah. Last year he had Jesus. He replaced Jesus with Alvarez, who looks pretty good, by the way. And then he, he brought in this bloke called Harlan, you know, the best selling forward in the world. For four hundred thousand mm. pound a week, paid his dad twenty five million just to sign him, signed for fifty one million, another twenty million to another agent. Yeah, all those numbers are hidden away, but let's not go there, right? Um, so basically, when you have that guy, you have to adapt who you are, and he's done that, and he's he's able now to go over people, so he's got all the tools, mate, and so he can he looks really really flexible and adaptable, and that's our next phase. Yeah. Yeah, and, and and that's an interesting point, right? Flexible and adaptable, oh, it's all well and good if you have the tools to be flexible and adaptable and have players that can play in multiple ways. First, you have to establish a first way of playing that works. Then you have to work on tools to have a plan B. And and I, I think it it is an interesting idea, this idea of a project and where we are in the project. And I actually have a really good question about that that I want to ask you, Paul, but I'm... I'm going to answer 1.76 acres at 1.76 acres on Twitter's question of how would an ugly stumble across the finish line really impact our summer? Isn't that what happened last year? Do we over index these things relative to off season business and future success? I think this is a great question because in our mind, we're like, Oh, if we stumble now and only pick up three points, the rest of the run in it's going to damage confidence and we're going to be dreadful. And then, you know, we can't build on this season, but like, we stumbled over the line last season badly, lost top four when we had it fully in our hands, and went on to be the runaway title contender of the season. And in preseason, looked imperious. And we made the moves we needed to strengthen the team, and we went from strength to strength. So I do think that there, there, is, too much, there is too much presumption that we make about the impact. Because I also think this is hard for us as fans, I really think, to, to process. For the players, it's a job. It's a job. And I think the players, even more than the fans, the minute that final game of the season is done, they can flush it, go on their holiday, go on boats and nightclubs and private jets and live luxurious lives and just flush it. First of all, I think to be an elite athlete, you have to have the memory of a fruit fly. And I think they can do that. But let me just say one thing for me personally. And this is just me personally. And the thing about personal connection to a season is everybody's different. There is no world where this season is anything but a success, in my view. But also, if we were to fall away now, it would damage the way I think about it. If we were to finish 10 points adrift of City, because you know what? Like, I want to be able to say we ran this city close and that, you know, yeah, they're, they, they're financially doped and we got to a, almost record points for our club and record goals scored. Like, for me, the story I want to tell myself about this season hinges on us not st- stumbling over the line at a distance from city. So that's just me. I'd like to see us go win the rest of these games or four out of the five remaining games. And if we finish five points back, so be it. But we ran them close and we got to 88 points or whatever. I just hope we'll go and do that. And I think we will, by the way, but like, so for me, it would matter. I think in the story I tell myself of the season, but I don't think it will matter in the future of the season. Um, But I think in terms of managing expectations, Paul, there is, there's an interesting question of when you turn the corner from it being a project and when it becomes winning time, right? Because at some point, like you, you have to, the project has to come to fruition. It almost mm-hmm. did this season earlier than expected, but Edward Haggins at Edward Haggins one on Twitter says, how do we manage expectations next season? Part of the joy of this season was the unexpected. If things don't work well next year, how much scrutiny is acceptable? Are we at a point where process is no longer a term the club can hide behind? Uh, So expectations. Personally, I'm like, 
each year is, each season is going to be different. If we replayed this season and just changed a few things in preseason, got started a little slower. The guys didn't come in till the end of the summer. Had a a poor result in the first game or or three games. Initial conditions with complex systems can send it off in a whole other different direction. So you can't take this season and say that's a given. Now, what would next season be based on this? Next season, replaying this season would turn out differently. It just would. So I got to stay open to whatever happens next year. I think we'll strengthen. We should be better. We should be stronger. We should push on. I'm sure we will. But there's no givens here. The whole thing around the media and the expectation, like the media are going to media. That's the problem. If we fall off towards the end of this season, we're going to have lots of Gary Nevilles out there with their narratives. The summer is going to be full of those. As soon as we hit a bobble next year, kind of halfway or three quarters of the way through the season next year, the narratives will kick, off, will kick off. And if that gets to a certain level, I think it can become problematic within the team. But that's life. Every team, like, you know, the history of the Chicago Bulls under with uh, Michael Jordan. Mm-hmm. They were perennial uh Losers yep. mm-hmm. it, yeah, in the final until they weren't, right? Mm-hmm. And it wasn't when he was 23 or 24 that they started winning all those titles. So you yeah. build and you build and you you build up your own mentality by shutting out the noise. And the pro- like, when does a project end? A project never ends until it blows up, right? Until mm. it's had so much success. We've sold off all, like Liverpool's project went right up till probably the start of this season. <laughs> now, <laughs> they didn't know they had a new project. Uh, they should have known. They should have planned for a new project. So, like, we're at phase three. Till we get to phase five, the project goes on. Uh, we got to all keep our nerve. I know it's hard, and, you know, how much scrutiny? The team's going to get loads of scrutiny. Is that fair? That's life. So there's going to be loads of scrutiny. It's going to be questioned. We're going to question it. Listeners are going to question it. Fans are going to start to grumble more than they did before because expectations don't come linearly. You know, the, we'll be disappointed that we went back to some of the things we remember football being about a few years ago, but we won't go back to the dark place. There's too much mm. good going on here. We'll have more ups and downs emotionally. Thing like we beat everybody you wanted to beat this year. We beat Spurs twice. We beat Liverpool. Uh, once <laughs> <laughs> we uh we almost beat city once um you know we, uh we won what seven north london derby uh, or uh, london derbies i would take a season where we win seven north london yeah, derbies that, i don't know be... how it would happen but i'd take i guess you'd win what you'd win the home and yeah. away you'd beat yeah. them in the fa cup you beat them in the league cup and you beat them home and away in, in the, the champions, champions league, league. That would be six. Yeah. Oh, uh, well, I was going to say you could beat them in the Community Shield, but that would mean that they have to win a trophy, and it's not possible. Yeah, so, unfortunately, we can't get to seven. anyway. Yeah. So, we've we've beaten loads of good teams this year. Uh, next year won't be so smooth in some departments. We'll be stronger in others. Expectations. You throw it all up in the air and, and see how it lands. We'll go stronger. We'll be better. Yeah. Yeah. I but, mean, I, I, think, I think it is at least fair, though, yeah. to go into next season – it's, inevitable it's never fair to say go into the next season and win the title because like you can't, you, it is never fair to say to a team, you have to get to 92 points. That's your goal this season. If you don't get there, it's failure. I mean, if you want to say that, like, by the way, of course, be my guest. If we get to 90 points next season and again, don't win the title, I'm not going to slam the team. I think there are certain goals that we need to hit. I don't think anybody wants to go back to it being a battle for top four. I don't think that would be great. Um, but Clive, this, and we're this going is to have to combine the Champions League and a proper yep. push. Yep. We, we, we can't just that. treat it as a cup competition. It's, it's going to be a much bigger strain. Pep trusts 18 players, and you could say Arteta should trust 18 players, but he shouldn't. He should trust 12 He should trust or 18 13. when he has 18 trustable players. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Okay, Clive. Here's an interesting one because, you know, I think how we look at our possibility of winning a title and winning other things depends on who else is out there. Like right now, it feels like a very down period for the continent. And so the Champions League looks looks much more doable. Look at two of the teams that are in the semifinal right now. Um, But what about this? And I'm just reading the Twitter Twitter name. I don't write it. Ole Suck Suck at Rob Taylor 17 (laughs) asks, 
is it better if Pep wins the treble this season and essentially accomplishes everything with City and then can finally fuck off to another club? I've been yeah. wondering this myself, Clive. If, yep. if he wins the treble, maybe he just decides it's time. And like a Manchester City without Pep, maybe that's an 86 or 85 or 84 point perennial team instead of 92, 94, 96. What do you think? Mm. Well, firstly, it was really nice meeting 1.76 acres in New York. Actually meeting him. Yes, it so was. That was, really, yeah. that was really cool. Or as I, I call him, point seven six. That's his <laughs> shortened name. So I wanted to give him a shout out because he's been a long time supporter of us. So, um, yeah, great guy. Um, and, secondly, a, and a general great guy. Yeah. yeah on, on Pep, oh, mate, there, um, there's a wonderful article out there by Barney Rone about three or four days ago, which I discovered today, talking about Man City as a as an entity and how they make you feel. You know, there's a there's a cold, clinical way about how they approach these seasons. And they are a huge force, right? So and they take I'll say before, they take the stress away from me because of their excellence, their competence. And Yes, they have. A, you are right, Paul. It is 115 charges against them. They have those charges against them. But the commentators never talk about that. They just talk about their excellence and how they slap other teams around. They didn't. They didn't talk about Chelsea in, in the same way. You know, where's that? Where did that money come from in the last two decades? Until it all, till it all changed. Our perception of Russia changed, and suddenly everything blew up there, you know, um, but they accepted that then and they usurped us in our place in London. Globally, they have a huge fan base now. They've got more Twitter followers than us. Never thought I'd ever see it. You know, there's just, and but it, that's what happens when you have a lot of funds, I think. There's a bigger question here outside of Pep, for example. I think there's a bigger question about ownership in the UK and what it's going to do to the 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 so-called historical pecking order within the game. If Manchester United are bought by Qatar, what does that mean? Don't worry about Pep, just worry about the funds here. Look what's happening at Newcastle. And to be fair to Newcastle, seven players that played against us last season are still playing in their team right now. So that's a that's a coaching story with money behind it. So that could change. Man City, we all know what's happened there. Chelsea, we all, we all can see what's happened there. 600 million spent, hasn't worked out yet. Next coach comes in, all those young players, a huge opportunity. I don't just look at it as as Pep going away earlier. I think about the changes within the English game and how it's been managed, governed. Because if it's not Pep, it could be somebody else, could be something else. And then when you see that around you, you have a decision to make as a club. You say, do we fight the reg? Do we fight this by fighting how our ownership rules in the country, or do we say actually? Let's worry about ourselves, worry about our own alignment, worry about our own ambitions, worry about our own project, and make sure we continue that. And that will drive the expectations that you guys were talking to just now. My expectations are we're going to add to the squad. When we add to the squad, there's going to be a slight uptick in expectation that we may need to win a trophy, you know, to win a cup maybe. That may be coming to our vocabulary next year. But for me, the most important thing is sustainable Champions League because the finances are so different from the Europa League. If you have that for three, four, five years, we can really go. We can really go big, you know. And um, and we look around in London with Spurs and Chelsea, they're not positioned attractiveness-wise, you know, as we are. Manchester United have got work to do. You know, Liverpool have a rebuild ongoing. And we're sitting there layering on to what we've achieved this year with the younger squad in the league. We look really attractive. I think that's that's the most important thing. If you worry about Pep, what he's going to do, then we sort of might as well, I will say give up, but we take away the joy from what we're doing rather than waiting for him to scratch his knees or leave. I'd much rather say, you know, we can take him. We can take him if we keep our focus and we keep being smart in the transfer market and have more mm. Odegaards and, and maybe less... Nuno's, for example, if we can keep focusing on that, then I think we'll be fine. Yeah, I, I think we'll be fine. I think as long as Pep is at City, you start every season at best with a 5% chance of the title. You, you, you know what I mean? Like, because they're going to go to 90 or more points every single season he's there. 
It just feels like that. I know that's not what they've done, but like it feels like they'll just go where they need to go to win the title. I mean, Liverpool didn't win a title with, what, 98 points? It, it's outrageous. They go where they need to go to win the title. And, you know, the season they didn't, I Liverpool had it won so, so early, you know, and then it was Project Restart and it was just weird and City didn't really have the chance to chase them down. So, I, I mean, I it's think, a difficult one, Clive. I, think, I just think... Um... I, all, what you're saying, Ellie, is, is complete sense. But we just watched a game this afternoon, Spurs and Liverpool. Very hard to predict. Like two teams, two car, two car crashes, really. And um, mm-hmm. I remember, I remember the Champions League final, City versus Chelsea. City should have won that game. The team sheet comes out. You think, well, what's he doing? What's he gone and done? The first time he doesn't play the holding midfielder. They got popped off in centre midfield. Goal, lose one nil. Things can happen. Things can happen. I don't believe in the but the, they do. I don't think it's so predictable that it's just it's just going to. It's not rock predictable. On. It's more the point that like the range you know they're going to be in at the end of the season, somewhere between high eighties and high nineties points yeah. every season, means that like you can't. I mean, you're going to need a point total to win the title as long as Pep is at City. That's the Invincibles or better. <laughs> That's that's the target. And it just it puts you under so much pressure all season long. Because even when they're losing at Anfield and drawing it home to Frank Lampard's Everton, in the back of your mind, it's why we call them that T1000 Terminator. You just know, don't drop points. They will catch you. Don't you dare drop points. They will catch you. And that pressure they put you under, knowing where they're going to get to, it, it, it really does create a, a totally different situation. I, I want to ask you'd, a couple of questions. You'd absolutely take Pep leaving. I mean, oh, for who God's wouldn't sakes, take it? Of course, yes. A, and he, and, and him, give it to Sherwood. See what they could do with Sherwood. Yeah. You know what him I mean? winning like, the like, Champions League. boring having a great coach. Give, give it to Sherwood. Oh, I love yeah. I think he's great. Uh, <laughs> got to Sherwood? keep him in the country. Yeah. Not Sherwood. I've oh, seen Pep? Sherwood. Yeah. I'll keep, keep him in the country. country. Just don't let him coach he, any he, team with any money. Yeah, he, he can be Everton's coach or something. You know, yeah. be fine. That'd be fine. The, fun, the funny thing is, I do think there's an interesting debate about are there coaching styles that only work if you have the most elite talent of high technical quality, right? Like you might yes, even say like, are. did did Arteta struggle early on at some level because the football he wants us to play demands a technical level that we couldn't hit? So uh, look, does it, does I want to get to- require a squad of guys who are good on the ball? Yes, it does. Yeah. It just does. And, and that's not what we had. And- I, I think uh, I think it'll be interesting to see as we go into the summer and who we recruit, what qualities Mikel and Adu feel are most important to get us even closer to City. I want to ask some some buying and selling questions. Interestingly, here's what's interesting, by the way. Goes to show you where people's heads are at. I ask for questions, right? Discord, Twitter. We play Chelsea on Tuesday. Not a single question about the game. Not one. And I think it tells you people are already looking ahead, right? It's already off on the horizon. What can we do next? When can we get there next? Um, But I got good news for you. One sponsor today. How about that? Just the one. But it's an important one, and we're going to treat them like the important sponsor that they are because when when you are building a team, right? When you're building a team, it's all about the talent. You wish you need to handpick the stars to build a team. And nobody helps you do that like Indeed. Indeed is the hiring platform where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. Don't spend hours on multiple job sites looking for candidates with the right skills. When you can do it all in Indeed, find top talent fast. Indeed, suite of powerful hiring tools like matching assessments and uh, matching assessments and virtual interviews. Hate waiting. Indeed's U.S. data shows that over 80% of Indeed employers find quality candidates whose resume on Indeed match their job description the moment they sponsor a job. Candidates who you invite to apply through Instant Match are not one, not two, but three times more likely to apply to your job than candidates who only see it in search, according to U.S. Indeed data. With Indeed matching, as soon as you sponsor a post, you get a short list of quality candidates with resumes. On Indeed, match your job description. Boom! It's hiring. At warp speed! Indeed does the hard hiring for you. Sponsor a job. And they'll match you with the quality of candidates. Join over 3 million businesses worldwide using Indeed to hire great talent fast. And by the way, like, like, like honestly, why, why would you use anybody else but Indeed? Because you only pay for quality applications that meet your must-have job requirements. I mean, but come on! I feel like I'm taking crazy pills. Come on. Visit Indeed.com slash BlueWire to start hiring now. Just go to Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Terms of just imply. Cost for application pricing not available for everyone. Need to hire? You need to hire! Is that enough of that? Indeed. Now that- 
just so good. It just, you feel it right there in your, you know, like in your core, it connects to your core and you're like, yes, that's the ad read we needed. Okay, everybody, we're back. We're back. We're back with a question as simple as simple can be. So I'll ask it to Clive because it's so simple. Clive Playa on the Discord asks, who should we sell from our current squad? Okay. So who who I would sell? You know, I like this. Who should we sell? Let me read it again because it's complicated. One. I want you to get all the words. Yeah. Who should we sell from our current squad? Okay. Question mark. He actually didn't put a question mark. It might just be a statement. Okay. So who I would sell? So we've got a lot to sell, right? So we've got Nuno to sell. Uh, looks like Manton Niles is going on a free. Reese Nelson, what's his space on that? Lots of teams are looking at him, and that's a, he may end up going on a free. So see what happens. What there. would you do? Would you keep him? I would keep him. I I, yeah, I think this. I think, I I think he's um something in there. There's something in there, and he has the speed and energy. I think he's a. He, I think he's a decent rotation option. Definitely he looks after the ball, and he's getting braver. He wants it. So um, yeah, I'd keep him. Um. Kieran Tierney looks like he's going up north to me. Um, so it makes sort of sense. Wants to play. 25 years of age. 35, 40 million. I would do it. Um, You're talking about Newcastle, right? Because I think there were even some city rumors. I don't buy Yeah, them. I'm thinking Newcastle. Just makes sense. Um, the interesting ones for me, there's a couple of interesting ones. Um, also, people know. Let's not let's not insult anybody about the people on the outside of our squad who all like to sell, like Pepe, for example, because our listeners are far more intelligent than that. But there's two players that I think are interesting that are in rumours, and that's Smith Rowe and Granite Shaka. Now, Arsenal are supposedly ready to listen to offers for Granite Shaka, and I think I find that extremely interesting if true. You know, Smith Rowe. I haven't seen any rumours, but we all got this little thing in the back of our minds. I wonder what his future is, right? And selling youth players is really good for our balance book because it's all profit that year. And so that's the sort of thing that allows you to really spend elsewhere. So all those people wanting Kaiseido and Rice, how do you think this is going to happen? So Smith Rowe becomes a very valuable commodity to potentially us having the big signings that people want to see. But the Granite Shaka one is directionally something completely new because he is a lieutenant in the, in the group. He's a leader in the group. He's Arteta's guy. If that's true, that's something that's been agreed two years ago. We want yeah. to stay. Yeah. We want to sign up. You're an adult. We, when we get this club into a Champions League, you can go off to, and go and make your career elsewhere. If, the, if that's a baby's here, go to Italy and do your thing for the next three, four years. If Mkhitaryan is still kicking it in in Italy, Granit Xhaka's got a long time. He's got a long career ahead, you know. And yeah. so, um, mm-hmm. and so, and that, so that is an interesting one. And I and I do think there's there's I think selling is almost more important than than who we buy. I think it facilitates. We can't empty the squad completely because we want Paul's eighteen, right? We want eighteen. That's not going to happen by giving people away who are, we all know are at the standard. And Granit Xhaka would be one of those. So how do we get to 18? Everybody wants to know about Balogun and Eddie, though. I think that that's well, that's where a lot of the intrigue Balog- is. Balogun is interesting because I've seen things at PSG, seen Marseille, um, seen Milan. I would do it. I would probably sell because he's at his absolute peak now. You know, and, um, sorry, I shouldn't say he's at his absolute peak. He's had a good peak season. Peak of value. You mean. Peak of value. Thank you, Elliot. Uh, peak of value. I think is it makes sense. But it all depends on how we invest. Eddie now, again, it's a potential option. I think what we've got to be wary of, really, because we've had a good season this year and people are looking at our players in a different light. And when we're sitting there watching Liverpool players, backup players going out the door for 27 million, maybe maybe that's us this year because they've done quite well, some of our sort of squad players. And if they're deemed, if they can't get into our team now, it's deemed to be a, you're not done. If you can't get into a team that finishes eighth, then you're not, you've got no value. 
if you can't get into a team that finishes second that's been top of the league for 200 weeks, then your value goes up. So it'd be interesting to see what we do. But I, I wouldn't be... I think it's all about market opportunities. If the, if the market says to you, Emil Smith-Rowe, Aston Villa, 35 million, then you have a question to ask, answer. You know, mm. if if Brighton pop along and say to Eddie, we want you to be our striker with Evan Ferguson, be one of the two strikers, Danny Welbeck's getting older, and we want to pay 35 million for you, what do you do? You know, and, this, and that these yeah, are the sell. challenges we, we're gonna we're gonna have. Kieran Tinney, thirty five million, Newcastle, forty million. What do you, you do? Sell. Yep. What do you do? And when you're talking about project, you often hear me talk about my high performance team models. There's a consistent <laughs> line that runs underneath them and it's called renewal. And we mustn't be afraid of it. Renewal is good. If it's good value, there are lots of players that we're linked to and there are lots of players that want to come. Don't be afraid of renewal, as long as it's smart renewal. Right? If you renew and make yourself weaker, then we're going to have a, a few podcasts, aren't we, Elliot, about that discussion? Yeah. Yeah. I, it, so it's interesting, right? I think this is this is the one time, and it's tough. We, we had questions. Uh, we had a question sort of saying so much of the joy of this team and the connection to it, the spirit of this Arteta project has been undergirded by – is that a word? Undergirded? No. Well, it is now. I like it. Girded? Girdle? You know what? Let's move on. <laughs> has been has been supported by, buttressed, that's a word, it has, been, has been buttressed by the inclusion of and importance of academy players and young players. But like Bukayo Saka came into a terrible arsenal and had room to develop. Emil Smith-Rowe did too, ironically. As you get more to be a title challenger and a Champions League challenger, there's not going to be room for sentimentality and there's not necessarily going to be room for the academy players. Like early in seasons, you'll see some academy kids show up in Manchester City's team. You know what I mean? Who was the one who was showing up in City's team earlier this season? There was some academy player they had. I can't uh, remember his Lewis, name. Lewis, wasn't it? Rico Lewis, is that it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it was like, oh, you know, an academy player from Manchester City. It's like a shooting star. It's like seeing, you know, Isn't it's like Kanji seeing the end of the rainbow. An academy player. Uh, yeah, maybe I no. He's no, not. They boy me. Actually. They boy me from um, Germany. But yeah. my point is, like, then the season gets going, and it's like, oh no, academy players. <laughs> no, 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 sorry, we don't include those. But you can understand the problem. Like, this is where ruthlessness is going to come in. Like, you may have to say, sorry, Charlie Patino, sorry, Miguel Aziz. Like, there's no path for you. So either you're out on loan or you're sold. You may have to say, Balogun wants to play. Sell him and get the 35 million. Eddie, sell him, get the 35 million. Emil Smith Rowe is the tough one because he's not at the peak of his value. We have not given him a chance to really drive up his value. And we have seen him be very important. And I think people are very connected to him. He's Arsenal's number 10. So he's one. Smith Rowe is the one I'd be inclined to hold on to. Yep. I think you could be making a colossal mistake moving on from a player of that talent at this at this point. Oh, yeah. But you sell all those others. Yep. And you get Rice and Caicedo and Ivan Tony. By yep. the way, Ivan Tony is sort of a secret. Like if they tell, if they say it's like a twenty match, he's a ban, bit of a gamble. I'd, I'd buy. Oh, there it is. If they say it's like a twenty match ban, I, I, I'd buy him. Oh, Clive, it just it just clicked for Clive. It just clicked. The sound <laughs> there was clouding his brain, but then it clicked for Clive, and now he's Brilliant. now he's now he's laughing. Yeah, I would. I would. If it's a twenty match ban, I'd buy him. You know what I mean? Like I, I think. I think someone's going to go for him and, and and it's going to be a great choice and it gives you multiple ways to play. You'd be There's, ready for our run-in. <laughs> yeah, right? See, that's how you prepare for the run-in. You keep him nice and fresh by not being allowed to play. Um, a, another question though, Paul, and I think it is a really, a really good one, is about how we balance what's coming because frankly, I don't know that we've we balanced anything very well at any point, but Mr. Matt Knight on the Discord says, is it unrealistic to expect us to challenge for the title and go deep in the Champions League next season? If we're genuinely competing for the league again, is it still a step too early in the process to expect going deep in the Champions League? It's surely not a coincidence that in the past, out of the English teams that have got to the semis and the finals or won the Champions League, often they haven't been anywhere near challenging for the title. Yeah, Europe has traditionally been an either or for Europe, for English teams. Yeah. How do we do that? And and can we afford in a group stage? Because I think we might wind up in pot three, you guys, which means we could be in a group of like, you know, Madrid, Dortmund, Arsenal, and A and other, right? We we could yeah. get one of those groups. 
do we just rotate and play it like a Europa group and take whatever comes knowing that the league's a priority? How do you, how do, you do that, Paul? How do you balance yeah. what's going to be a big step up in midweek football? Yeah, I think that's a great question from Matt. I believe his name is pronounced Matt Knigget. Am I right? No, I think I, th- I think K N I G H T is is still pronounced okay. Knight. Yeah, uh, I'm not good yeah. at. Foreign Although you names. could be right, it could be phonetic. Yeah, it could be um, phonetic. I yeah, I don't know. You look, know, I I to to the question from, from you're really Matt. feeling yourself today, Paul. You, 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 you're stepping out today. You got to laugh uh, out of Clive, and now you now you feel unbeatable. You feel invincible. Yeah, uh, you want to go out and play 20 minutes at the end of the city game? <laughs> Elliot, focus, focus. There's a serious yeah. question in there. Yeah. Um, I think we could be in for a rude awakening next season because we're not going to treat the Champions League like anything other than us being in the Champions League and taking it seriously. And it will subtract from our league season. Uh, I think we'll absolutely be top four. I think we'll be second-ish, second, third. Somebody else will come up. We won't have as smooth a start. There'll be some a few issues, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I think... Next year is a year where you're in two competitions properly and you try to do well in both of them. But if you want to do great in one or the other, it's going to subtract from one or the other. I mean, we might get very lucky and be brilliant. We could get very unlucky and be terrible in two competitions. Most likely, they will subtract a little from each other and it'll be a growth year. But uh, people focused on the Premier League will think, well... Did they really push on next year? I think that's, it's very, very likely we'll be thinking, hmm, we don't feel like we've really pushed on in the league. Um, and even the peaking late thing, we're going to have a lot more games in, in people's legs. We'll be playing, you know, best part of 52, 53 games next season, uh, given that we'll probably stay in the cups because we'll have a deeper squad. Um, yeah, it's like there's, it could be a trap year, Elliot. Next year could be a trap year. <laughs> uh, this is probably a new term to you. I know it's a new term to me. I'm getting comfortable with it. Um, Since we understand trap games so well, I'm sure yeah. trap year will be even easier to explain. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd be quite ruthless on on the question of who we ca- keep and who we don't. And I only really see... 11 players that are absolutely 100% bulletproof. I prob- Kivior would be one I'd add in. Uh, probably Tommy and Jorginho will be part of the squad of people I would want to keep. We buy another three players. We're at about 16. I, I think all the guys are up for like Tierney, Nelson. Uh, every- I absolutely keep Smithrow. Eddie up for grabs. Uh, Balogun. You know, all those guys are guys you would take. I would say you take money for because we need players that fit that 17 or 18 you absolutely trust to start in Champions League or in the league. So everything's up for grabs. If Tommy can stay fit, obviously we bought Kivior because we believe in him. Jorginho is still a quality player. You can play in a lot of games. Rice, a uh, uh, right center back. Uh, we're going to buy a winger. You know, you're basically at, that's 9, 11, 14. That's 16, 17 players there. And I absolutely keep Smith Rowe. I think he's a special player. I don't I don't think he's a starter, but I think he's a special player if he can get back to his levels. You're around 17 or 18. I'd add one more. Everybody else is, a, like, I have Vieira in my list. Of, it, Elliot, I have a question from uh, Mr. Paz Nin in my pants. Mm. Would you take... If Vier- if there was a mix up with Vieira's contract and and it turns out we don't own him in the summer and we get our thirty five million back, would you buy Fabio Vieira in the summer for thirty five million, Elliot? No, I wouldn't. Okay. <laughs> um, I don't think so, we can sell him, no. but like, no. he's not one of my eighteen. Like he he doesn't fit my eighteen mm. that I feel I will I would trust do or die next season. He might yeah. be 19 or 20 and he can develop and blah, blah, blah. And time. I expected more for, from him at this point. And it just feels like he's a ways off in terms of, in terms of everything, really. I would just say, so, so I've, I've kind of put him in the bucket in my brain with Sambi and Ceballos in terms of players that I think have some neat technical qualities, but I'm not sure they have the right qualities for us and, and our league and all that. But if I look at Odegaard 
and how Odegaard played when he first arrived and stuff. There, there were questions oh, no. about being lightweight. No, I, Odegaard. Well, Odegaard's a better player, right? Ode, and Odegaard's a superior talent. But like, I don't know, uh, Clive. You want to weigh in on the on the VR thing? Yeah. Oh yes, please. Uh, I think maybe what we've discovered this year, we had some ideas around uh, Vieira playing uh, left eight. And he's quite interesting in that slot in certain times, late in games, shall we say, off the bench. And, and to be fair, to Clive, they did talk about him when he first came in as a left eight option, right? Yeah, I, I think. Edu. I, yeah, I think he's very flexible across that front group. And but I don't see us being strong enough yet to start him and Odegaard as a as a double eight pairing. I just don't feel as secure in in, in certain games. We are talking Champions League next year. And again, <clears throat> post-international break, again, Martin Odegaard has flattened out in April. He did this last season as well. And I think Fabio Vieira value will grow in our minds next year. But I think he should be the guy that shares game time with Odegaard, not with Xhaka. I think we need to invest in that position properly with a stronger box-to-box player that can manage the physicality of the Premier League. And that and Vieira for me is the third midfielder, the one that plays the last pass, the last cross, rather than the one that's going box to box, making tackles, looking for second balls. That's not him. And I think he's much better on the right hand side coming on his left foot. So I think his value to us will change next year when we have more higher quality games and he can play in the Odegaard position when Odegaard cannot play sixty games a season. And we are seeing that again for the second year, when it really counts, he's unable to produce in the money month. So part of our process is we must learn that, recognize that, and save his energy. Because when he's hot, we are hot. Odegaard, I mean. When he is really special, we are really special. And we lose him at this time of the year. And it's the second year we've done this. And and so Vieira's value will change in our minds, but I promise you next year. I want to ask you a question well, here's a quick one. Like, let's do this one quick, and then I want to ask something about Ramsdale because I think it's interesting. So this question comes from 8097 in the Discord. Clive, who's Arsenal's best player? Our best player is Bakayo Saka, in my mind. Are you saying mm-hmm. who's our player of the season? Or who's our, our best, best player? player? No, who's our best player? Our best player is Bakayo Saka. And the reason why I think he's okay. our best player is his goal involvement. And what he does, goals and assists, and his all-round game. And more importantly, what he does at the critical moment. I think he he scores, either scores the first goal or sets up the first goal. I think that's really important to all of our sanity. <laughs> you know, um, mm. And I, I think he's really decisive, and he's decisive at, at 21. And so for me, I think he's our, he's our best player. We've all got this tired player in our minds at the moment. So if I if I asked you that, but I don't think you'd ask me that six weeks ago. You would ask, yeah. You know, you it'd just be like, "Don't be so stupid." <laughs> you know, do you think there's so, any sentimentality involved in that in that determination? You know, like like let's put it this way: before the knee injury, the, our best player was Gabriel Jesus. Yeah, you know what I mean. And, yeah. and I think it was between the two of them, really, Elliot. And it's quite mm-hmm. interesting to watch Jesus, who fought back from that knee injury. He's come back. He came back a little bit chunky, got fit, looks a bit sharper, and he sort of hit the in the wall again. You know, as you do when you mm. come back from injury. Yeah. And I, yeah. I, when you have an injury of that, it's a three month. Um, it can take six weeks or so, seven, maybe two months to get back to your levels. And so, although he's really tried, he scored goals. The last couple of games, I've noticed him just not being as powerful and as sharp as he was early in the season. That will come back. But we need him to play, don't we? So, um, so yeah, it's a debate. Yeah. But for me, it's Saka just because of his um, consistent season-long impact, goals and assists, tackles, passes, the whole lot, mate. Yeah, and I mean, there were probably a point in the season where I, Odegaard was in the conversation. I think there's work to do on his consistency across the season. The irony is, if you said 24 months from now, Bakayo Saka is our best player, sure, believe you. If you say 24 months from now, Gabriel Martinelli is our best player, I believe you. If you say 24 months from now, Odegaard's our best player. I believe you. I think all of Saliba. them have it in there. Well, so what I was going to say is my dark horse, maybe best player at Arsenal right now might be William Saliba. A ball-playing, physically imposing, pace, pacey center back 
who can cover all the space behind, win all the physical battles, play the ball up the pitch, dance around people, crife it and switch it to, to send you away when you're under pressure. And oh, by the way, let's not lie. He's benefiting from the look at what you look like when I'm not there tax, right? And look at what that right pod looks like without me. And look at what Thomas Party looks like without me. And look at what Martin Odegaard looks like without me. And so I, I while I do think it is probably Bakayo Saka, I think William Saliba, Paul, has, has thrust himself into that conversation in his absence, especially knowing that, look, Bukayo Saka is a unicorn player, but finding a tricky, talented, goal-scoring, assisting forward isn't impossible. They're out there. I'm not saying they're out there in quantity at Bukayo Saka's level, but they're out there. Finding a pacey, physically imposing, technically secure, elite passing center back is like, name me another one. With Van Dyke looking the way he is, it's Stones, who doesn't even really play center back anymore, sort of. Like, yeah. Name me another one. So I, I don't know, Paul. I, I think if you wanted to to pick Saliba, I wouldn't have an argument with it. Yeah, no, I, I think he can be... I mean, he could be brilliant. He could be every bit as important. Uh, it's kind of the replacement value thing or the replacement level of the guy that comes in a, after him. You could imagine, as you've just said, us having a great attacking option from the right wing. who's not quite as good as Saka. Um, but you could imagine not having a center back that's not quite up that's up to the level of William Saliba and we just can't play the way we can in a sense there's an argument for a fully fit Thomas Party being the most impl- important player in the team because he's a player that let, lets us play in a particular way i think Saliba fits into that category i think there are other really good players we could find who would let us play in the same way without Bukayo Saka so there's an importance Best player, I mean, it's always going to get be hard to get past Saka, but I absolutely think that Saliba has a great chance to push him close if he goes all the way and stays fit and strong and all that good stuff. Mm. Yeah, the the great joy about what we have in, in our squad, and you said it earlier, because we're so young, their, their ceilings are, like, incredible, aren't they? You know, and the variance, see, the potential variance, right? Like where a player goes from who they are at 21 to who they are at 24 can change. Like Deli Alley. I mean, yeah. it's hilarious because he's a Spurs player, but the Deli Alley story is somewhat sad if it weren't for the fact he's a, a Spurs player. Like he's sad. Jack Wilshire. Mm-hmm. So there's a sad. lot of potential variance in where a player goes from 21 to 24, you know, especially when they're playing 4,000 minutes to, across all competitions in a season. You know? I, I, this is why I think this summer squad building is really important because – there's little things that we're just accepting now. So the, the Martinelli goal against Southampton, the way he just whipped that in, we just like jog back to the halfway line and just thought, well, that's what we expect. That's a great goal. You know, and, um, and he's doing really good things. But he can't play every minute of every game. You know, Saliba, again, post the World Cup when he first came back, he lost his rhythm. Then he refound again before the World Cup. He was, you know, unbelievable. You know, just unbelievable. If we can look after him, share minutes with him, get a right foot centre half that can play both sides, and look after him, protect him, we can, we've got him for the money months, and no one's getting past him, you know. And so we're just building the next phase, and their potential is just huge. The twenty-one, the two twenty-one-year-old wingers, Saliba, Odegaard, these are major, major forces in the, in in the world's game, and their best days are ahead, right? And Gabriel, you know, Gabriel, big Gabby, shall we say. Again, two years ago, struggling in the team. Now he's a mainstay in the team. You know, so we, we've got a lot to look forward to. And it's very hard at the moment when you're watching us being laughed at by the other football fans because we were top of league for so long. But you look at these players in like Ramsdale and White, they're all 24 and under. We've got a lot to um, to look forward to if we can manage their careers appropriately and add to the group. And I think, I honestly think we'll do that in the summer. Um, As we start to wrap up here, I want to ask you something uh, that I think is, it's weirdly become a topic conversation. I actually don't think it's an issue, but we might as well come up with it uh, or uh, touch on it, Paul. Albrecht Schultz at Kojabo Berlin or Kojabo Berlin on Twitter says, weird week as Ramsdale has either received praise or blame. 
Where do you guys see Ramsdale once he has a complete defense in front of him with a great support in defensive midfield too? We also had another question about Ramsdale not going long as effectively. You know, some of those quick sidewinders and release balls and not really seem to have the confidence on his long distribution like he had or, or the quality, I should say, in his long distribution like he had at certain times in the season. And Scott's posted some some stats, so don't blame me. I'm just reporting the news. I think on his Canon Stats site and stuff about where Ramsdale ranked in sort of post-shot expected goals stuff. So basically like after the shot. where And last season he ranked 40 out of 42 Premier League keepers. This season he's not much higher than that, um, having allowed a lot more expected goals than the shots he's faced would would the data would suggest. What's weird to me is I feel like Ramsdale's just saved our ass a ton. But to be fair, the, the data disagrees. So where what do you where do you think we are with Ramsdale in all facets? And he's also a young player, by the way, very, very young by the standards of a goalkeeper. Is, is there a there there? Uh so I think goalkeeper metrics are the dodgiest things on the planet, I gotta say. Uh, I think it's a really tough thing to measure. Is it Harrison, John Harrison, who does it? Yeah. I think has his own metrics that are actually really good. And the way he analyzes keeper is really good. And I think yeah, it's more he's been a lot more bullish on Ramsdale. Yeah. yeah. And he really applies the eye test and the technique and the decision making and where you should and shouldn't. And he, he's pretty high on Ramsdale and his decision making. He keeps making the point that he's a really young keeper. And for a young keeper, he's making very, very good decisions when to come out, when to stay, when to go down and spread, when to stay up. Um, I certainly get, I think there's a bit of recency, something or other here. Bias is maybe the wrong word, but we've seen recently as our, uh, defense, we play with the highest line in the league bar city, and we've been in trouble defensively over the last few games. It's not just holding or our center backs or our full backs that are being dropped in it. Now you've got this huge space for putting pressure on Ramsdale to make decisions about when he comes out, when he drops. He's got, uh, you know, we saw a penalty given away with Gabrielle sliding in in the box from the right-hand side of the box. There's all sorts of hijinks, shenanigans, and keystone cops going on in his box in front of him. Um, it doesn't leave for, lead to the most stable defensive situations and decision-making. I think he's, he's got a big mentality. Uh, I think his distribution's particularly good. I don't think our distribution options have been very good recently. Uh, upfield in terms of players available, winning knockdown, second balls, and that, you know, the wave starts far from the beach. And so you can only hit what's ahead of you. You can only make stable choices when what's ahead of you is stable. Now you got to start mixing it up, playing safer. Yeah, I, I don't think the... The, the recent few games show Ramsdale at his best. I don't think it shows most of our players at our best. I think Ramsdale's great, fine, will get better each year. The, the baseline of his decision-making under pressure is very good, and he'll get smarter and smarter and make fewer and fewer rash decisions. Um, he's not Elan Meslier. Um, mm. who, who yeah. I think is a very talented guy, but unfortunately spends every season... Uh, in clusterfuck territory as a goalkeeper, which is never going to help you debug your... It gives you lots of experience, but not the good kind. And Ramsdale's probably had three quarters of a season where things are fairly contained and you can make very good decisions and a quarter of a season where it's a little more chaotic than is good for a keeper. Yeah. That comparison is uh, actually really, really apt, Paul. Is it Melier or Meslian? And that, because... They are two of the most experienced goalkeepers in Europe at the age under the age of twenty four, mm. and I think they are similar positions in their national team. Obviously, two strong mm. national teams, England and France. And it's quite interesting to watch the Leeds goalkeeper have dark moments, you know, but his talent is huge. And you look at Ramsdale, and he has less less dark moments. But they're still young goalkeepers. They they're really yeah, young. yeah, oh yeah. They're really young. And I've seen an improvement in Ramsdale in one on ones. We all have. 
this last last year he just he just fall down and chip it over him. <laughs> this year he saved yeah. us in one on ones. The next thing is penalties because people not having him because he can't save penalties and <laughs> with one hand with a blindfold on we're not having that. We've got to I save just penalties. Want to go to the right side. <laughs> well, look, next year is all about going the right side. The year it after can't that he can be save any worse. You. Than, no, it can't be any worse than Petr Cech. I was convinced Petr Cech was intentionally trying not to save penalties. Yeah. Like, <laughs> literally so, trying not I, to save. I, I think we have. We've got the mate. Well, we've got we've got a ten year goalkeeper, there, haven't we? If 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 we're, mm. if we're smart, I I do think he's got. This is my weakness thing with him. He's young, and I I, I you may laugh at me, but I think he gets. I think he gets mentally tired on occasions, and he can look quite civ like. And I haven't got the England game out. I think it was England hungry last summer when he, he shouldn't have played. He got his chance. He was exhausted from the season. And I think England lost four. He wasn't the only one exhausted. All the other players were exhausted. I think they lost four or five. And that, and that stuck on him. You know, it, it, it stuck on him. And he hasn't had an England chance since. And Nick Pope's gone ahead of him. I think it's wrong. But I think he has time. I look at him and think, you need not to play. So we look. I'm looking at Matt Turner next year. And with the increase in cup competitions we're going to be in, more important competitions, I've, I think he's going to play a lot more games. I think his development is one we need to be looking at really closely because he's going to be in the FA Cup, the League Cup, and potentially, because not all the Champions League games are strong, potentially the Champions League games as well. And so what's his space? I think they've got to share those games to keep Ramsdale mentally fresh. Because when he's fresh, I think he's, I think he's really good. Let's finish with this. Just a quick one. Since it is happening uh, the day after this released, Clive, like we are playing a terrible, terrible, terrible team on Tuesday. It just so happens they wear a shirt that has a lot of, I was going to say history. They have no history, but it has a lot of background to it, a, a lot of uh, emotional weight to it in terms of what we think of them. We hate them, and we have a chance to just heap more misery on them. And I think we need to do that. In a way, I think it's the perfect opposition. A team we hate that feels like a big, ge- a big game and a big team, but they stink and we can kill them. So how do you think about this game in terms of the timing of this opponent and the extent to which we can win it? I mean, I I see 5-0 or 6-0, but I would take 3 or 4. What about you? <laughs> oh, God, why do you do this? Why do you, why do, you do this to me? Um, at this moment in time, the Arsenal world needs three points. That's what we need more than anything. I don't care who we're playing. We we need three points. We because we need a reminder that we're not done. You know what I mean? And we're not we're not the team we ended the season last year frazzled. Do you know what I mean? We really need three points massively. It's it's a huge game obviously at the Emirates on on Monday with the, with the women's team. And if they do what they need to do, I think it could lift the club. And I think it could roll into Tuesday another huge game. So. Just need the three points so we can just reset. Get comfortable with what we're doing. Get comfortable with who we are. We've got to put pressure on City. This season is not... Uh, it sounds crazy, right? We know that City are the best team in the world right now. That's that's the, what they are. But football's a strange game. and um, you just got to keep the pressure on and see what happens. Don't accept it. Just keep the pressure on and see what happens. When Fulham equalised today, I, I didn't think they are going to hold on. But it does, it, football's strange, right? Southampton went one up at Newcastle, didn't hold on. Football's a strange game. It, Forrest's got a 1-1 draw against them. If we're not there, it's not going to happen. But by rights, City are the best team. They should win it. But I just want to see the club get the win. That's so important to remind us of what we've done this year. Because right now we feel a little bit down. You know, um, I don't want that to continue much longer. So just get that win. Chelsea are still a, a strong opponent. There's still a lot of talent in that team. They lack glue. It would be a nice way to finish off the Bank Holiday weekend. I would say they have tons of glue, and they've been sniffing it based on having watched them recently. But, you know, everybody has a different explanation. Paul, you agree with me, right? Walk in the park, absolutely going to crush them. Nothing to worry about. Should be an easy one. Six, seven, eight, pick your number. You yeah. want to hear an interesting stat, by the way. They've conceded fewer goals than we have. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I feel very much the same as I did going into the Southampton and West Ham games. 
Mm. So yeah, yeah we and those turned out. <laughs> I, I was I was um I was in a coma. Those those went fine, right? Everything went fine during those games. Um, mm. Yes, they did, Elliot. Good, good. Okay. What, what's that movie where Sandra Bollocks wakes? Uh, you wake up. I don't and, think her last name is Bollocks. Is it not? It's perhaps that's. <laughs> I think, a new... I think it's Sandra Bullock. But Bullock, you know, okay. Tomato, tomato, Bullock, Bollocks. I don't. Yeah. Mean, when you woke up it. in right, your right. bed, she was mm-hmm. sitting beside you. You were a little confused. She told you that we won both of those games and that she was your girlfriend, mm-hmm. fiance, in fact. And mm-hmm. uh, yes, the it unravels. There's a it, my wife is going to hate this part. Yeah. yeah. Continue. Yeah. What, what do you expect to happen in this easy, easy game that we have? I have here? no idea what's going to happen on Tuesday, m- more so than ever. I don't know. Let me ask know. you this. We here's here's a better one. We should wait, batter wait. them. But I have an actual question that people might to want to listen them. to the answer because th- this has been this has been trash. Do you think he's going to s- s- move away from holding? Do you think he'll go the, the 11 we've seen the last few games? Or do you think he will uh. relent and say it's time it's time for change? <laughs> Th- thanks, Rob. But it's time to say goodbye. <sighs> thanks for the memory. What do you think he'll do? I think he'll play him. Okay. I don't with, have with any the usual, big like, on it. like no changes, unchanged from City. Uh, I definitely think he'll change somebody, but it there won't be it won't be Rotationsville. Hey, uh, now that that's behind, like it, we're still going for the title. I think there'll be a change, and he'll look to the player who's most in need of it physically. Maybe it's a Thomas Party. Maybe it's a. I think there'll be a change. He won't make multiple changes unless he absolutely has to because he doesn't want to have that. Oh, everybody's playing against somebody different. I could see Jorginho for party and give him a breather, give him a rest, heal him. Um, and uh, on the other hand, I don't love Jorginho and holding in the same area of the pitch. Uh, but what are you going to do? I don't know. I don't know. Don't have any answers. Clive. Clive, we need we need some answers here. Is is he going to rotate? Where's the rotation going to happen? Um, is he going to stick with holding? Is he going to stick with the team that started? I mean, there's a part of me that says, you know what? Let that team that, you know, kind of blew it on Wednesday go out and beat Chelsea. They're good enough to do it and and don't change it. But do you think he will? Uh, the player I think deserves to start. It gives me a level of confidence as we're going through these rocky moments is Trossard. Uh, I just think that mm-hmm. he he should play. I don't see over over Jesus at this point, M- mate. I'll be honest with you. Our skipper's not playing well. Mm. Any of uh, tell me if you know I have my views on the midfield three, and people have singled out Thomas Pye. That's 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 their want and right. But are you telling me Odegaard and Shaka are playing well? I don't think they are. No, and Trossard can play in either of their positions, right? So. And so I do think that midfield three have all hit, hit a, a wall at varying amounts, you know, and they and they're, and they're flattened off. So and Trossard sitting there, bright, neat, brave, technically excellent, shoots off both feet, assists. He can't sit on the bench. You you choose who you don't want to play, but he can't sit on the bench. You know, so that's the change I would make. And. Um, Again, start of finishes, you know, my thoughts, it's not that big, big a deal. You should know your players and where they are health-wise and where they are fitness-wise and sharpness-wise. But Trossard, in the world of meritocracy world, I think he should start the game because he has yeah, shown us that. over a period of time he has been excellent since he's come in. And if somebody who's a fixture in our minds, in that 11, has to step out, then they step out because he's doing it. That's how it should work, right? So, um, so the manager makes his choice. I, I don't mind where it is, mate, to be honest, but he needs to start. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting because he could start, I think, for basically any of the front five and you couldn't argue with it. There is a part of me that says, you know what? Wouldn't it be fun to just see what kind of a powerhouse we might be in attack if he starts for Shaka and you go Martinelli, Jesus, Saka, Odegaard and, and Trissard. And maybe you're a little more vulnerable. Maybe you are, but find it out against a team that can't figure out how to score to save their life. Um, and and just go with it and see if it if it helps close those distances up. And maybe it means that Zinchenko doesn't have to get quite so advanced. I don't know. It, it could be interesting to just lean into the most attacking talent we have up front and be that team since we're not going to shut the back doors effectively as we'd like 
probably the balance of this season. I don't think that's what he'll do, but it, it would be an interesting one to see. Um, it wouldn't surprise me if Jorginho comes in for party only because party, everybody says he's carrying a knock. I have no evidence of whether that's the case or not, but if he is, we might see him come in, but I, I think absent Saliba's pace and the distance is being right. An immobile Jorginho exacerbates the problems we've been seeing, Clive. Oh, I just think another thought I've had, and I've had it for a while really, and, um, is keep your left back. And again, I'm assuming Holder's going to play. So when Holder's going to play, you've got, you've got to think about solutions to make him feel comfortable. And emptying your left back out and having Gabriel have a big space, which then makes him worry about covering Holding as well, means that system sort of breaks down a little bit. So if Holding plays, we have to realise if Holding is. When he's got people around him, he's, he's actually quite, you know, he's, he's okay. When you leave him in big spaces, what you're driving with him is decisions. And when you are making his decisions become harder to to reach, then you get indecision. And indecision is what's breathing through the rest of the team. So when he has a specific role, a job, which is either middle of the back four to close the game, he is brilliant. Or you say to him, you go get him. He's excellent. But now you're saying to him, you're going to have the most touches in our team have the most passes, and you're going to be in wide spaces on your own, and you've got to make jump-out decisions. I don't think it's as good consistently against the best opposition. So we're having a, a big back four. You know my, you know, I would anyway, Elliot. <laughs> uh, a big back <laughs> four. What you do, they all stay, they stay in place. They stay together. And then you can do things with Shinchenko in midfield if you want to, or you're sitting for a while. You have, to just, you have to stabilize the team whichever you, which way you have to because we're conceding too many goals. If Scott was on here right now, he'd tell us all about it. We're conceding <laughs> too many goals. So what are we talking about? Let's stop conceding the goals and go and win three points and decide how you want to do that. You know, So um, we've got a right center half problem. He's going to play, more than likely. So adjust. Do we got to do? Full back or double pivot or back three? adjust to allow him to stay into team and stop us conceding. So um, that's where that's where my head is. Yeah. Paul, final thought? Yeah. Uh, look, uh, so the Trossard one, he could play for Jesus. Jesus could play on the wing. Um, so whoever it is in that front four who needs the rest and only they would know, uh, Odegaard, uh, Saka, Probably not Martinelli. He seems fresh as a daisy. Uh, I'm with Clive. Trossard has to start, and he should uh, start in ahead of whoever needs a rest, but probably not on the wing. It's probably uh, at the nine or as one of the attacking eights. Um, and Jesus can move to the wing if necess that's necessary, or rest Jesus. I do think Party probably needs a little bit of a breather, a refresh, but if you're playing holding, I don't see Jorginho and holding. I just don't see it. And uh, yeah, agreed. Yeah, like great point on Kivior, but uh, you know we got Tier Kieran Tierney too. Uh, both of them should be defenders, and uh, yeah, uh, I, I could see four at the back. I could uh, a proper four at the back instead of Zinchenko, but. I don't see him moving away from Zinchenko, whoever is there, Jorginho or, or Party. So It'll be interesting I think the back to see. four is going to be the back four. We never thought we'd see Trent in centre mid for Liverpool, did we? Sometimes no. you just get, mm. your team tells you, we've got to do something to change this. And since he's dropped into inverted right back, their results are picked up. Sometimes you just yeah. got to do something. Just do something. Yeah. Well, I think and I Party think and Zinchenko something... start, though. Sorry. That leans into what you can do well in trying to instead of trying to fix what you can't. I think as a final thought for me in terms of how we play the rest of the season, it may be the case that right now we don't have a system that's going to make us solid at the back without compromising too much of our identity in terms of possession, territorial dominance, pressing. So maybe what you do is you lean in and you say, I'm going to get more attacking firepower on the pitch. I'm going to try to have more territory, more shots, and I may need to win three twos and two ones and four threes, but it's five more games. I'm going to go that way instead of 
here's a back three and I'm going to double pivot Jorginho and party and I'm going to, you know, go long, hit the channels to Sack and Martinelli and we try to win some one nils. That's not who we are. It's not who we've been. And I don't think it's the right way to solve the challenges we're facing right now. So we'll see what he does. I'm going to say something that's going to shock people, right? Because I've come all the way around on this. If he just starts holding again at home to Chelsea, I think, like, I think I'm okay. I, I don't trust that it'll work, but I think I'm okay with it if we, if we just really try to push ourselves forward, what do this is going to be, this is going to be a hard one for, for me, I think analytically, because I understand the quandary that he has. I understand the conundrum facing Mikel, which is there's no really clear, clean alternative, but this has produced pretty clear downside risk for the way we play. We'll have to see. It it's is a, a quandary, Elliot. It's, it's a, a quandary. It, it's a, it's a conundrum wrapped in a, in an enigma riddle. in bacon, in, in, in a bacon wrapped riddle. Um, I think we should leave it there as this has come off the rails. To be fair, probably 45, 50 minutes ago. So thanks for joining us. Uh, as we sit and record this, it is the final day of the fundraiser. So I'll put out a full update on the fundraiser Ooh. total tomorrow. I will draw the winner of the Ian Wright shirt. I'll draw the winner of the uh, Brighton VIP box where you will meet not just podcasters, but people from the club and uh, and get to be on uh, or, or in or around or involved in the filming of The Breakdown with uh, Adrian Clark and others. So it's going to be... It's going to be a great day, whatever the football brings. And of course, there'll be a lot more for me to say on this fundraiser as we wrap it up at the end of the day today. But it is a month that I think has far exceeded our wildest dreams of, of generosity that possibly could have been seen from, from everybody involved. So thank you. We love you so much for that. And we're looking forward to smashing, smashing Chelsea and smashing Wolfsburg. Two smashes, a smash at the Emirates on Monday, a smash at the Emirates on Tuesday. That's what we're looking for. And having joined me for this car wreck for the last 45 minutes, which included some good conversation at some point along the way, I'm sure. It's Clive. You can find him on Twitter at Clive PFC. Thank you, Clive. Thank you very much. Paul's on Twitter. Pause for my fans. Thanks, Paul. Woohoo. Almost forgot how we get out of this podcast. My name is Alex Smith. You can find me on Twitter at Gunner. We love you. And we will talk to you after Arsenal 10, Wolfsburg nil.